So welcome everyone to um, Startup Grind Adelaide, um, 28th of October 2013. Tonight we're very excited to have Philip Mays here. Philip Mays is from Mighty Kingdom and um, kicking heaps of ass. So let's sit down and have a chat with Philip Mays. Cool. <laughs> so um, Philip... Um, I guess just add a bit of context of why you're here. Can you tell us a bit about kind of what you're up to now, what it's like in a day of the life of Philip Mays? Right. So um, I'm the director of a company called Mighty Kingdom. Uh, we were founded back in 2010, I think, officially. Uh, initially as like a digital agency making apps for enterprise and things like that. But my background and my passion is in making games. And so in the last year and a half, we've... I've been trying to redirect the company away from uh, fee-for-service work and start to do more creative work. So um, this year, we to kind of kickstart that whole process, we set ourselves a goal of releasing 10 games in one year. Uh, to put a bit of context around that, there's five of us, or there were when we started this, this challenge, and we were still doing client work at the time. And as of Christmas this year, we should have released our 10th game. So we, uh, we managed to do that. So. A day in the life is actually quite busy, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, we you know, have to manage clients, but also manage the creative types. And just recently, I've started to grow the team. So now there's 12 of us. Cool. So in the last three months, we've almost tripled in size. Yeah, wow. That's huge. Yeah, it's been cool. <laughs> <laughs> well done. OK, so um, now we're just going to step back and walk through Philip May's life. Like, Startup Grind, we're really interested in kind of the story of um, how you got to where you are. Um, <laughs> how far back do we want to go? <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> like you grew up, like where did you grow up, Phil? So I, I'm actually from a very, very small town in New Zealand, of all places. Is it smaller than Adelaide? It's much smaller. So I was, I was actually telling someone the other day, uh, I grew up, our phone number was three digits. <laughs> and uh, I remember the day that they told us that we were going to get a fourth digit. And everyone was saying, how are we going to remember our phone number with four numbers? But, uh, yeah, so that's where I, where I grew up. And um, what, what year is that? In New Zealand, 1990? No, no, it was uh, <laughs> uh, in the 80s. Uh, it was a very, very small town, probably 7,500 people or so. Very oh, rural wow. community. But I, I was lucky in that um, my mum was very... Uh, she liked to, you know, she didn't deny us anything as kids, I guess you could say. She let us follow our passions from a very young age. And so I got into computers. I got a Commodore 64, and, uh, and that's where I started programming. I used to get... Did you, did you have disk drive? Uh, no, I used to tape drive initially. Yeah. Uh, we used to do this thing. My brother and I would, would put a game in to start loading, then we'd go outside and play cricket, yeah. and then we'd come back in and check how far it had gone. And Yeah, uh, yeah it was... Uh, it taught you patience. <laughs> you don't, you know, an app nowadays doesn't start instantly. You get angry. Well, we have to wait, you know, 30 yeah. minutes. Um, did you have cartridge um, soccer? No, I did not. That was my favourite Commodore 64 game. <laughs> well, this, I mean, it was a very interesting time. Like, uh, you know, that, that Commodore 64, it was really, there's nothing between you and, and the system. Like, you could get in there and mess around with memory and, and sort of, peek and poke things and in fact it was very easy to just stop a game that's running and then have a look at how they did things. Really? So you got in there? like you? Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, back in those days. Well, mind you, it was all kind of uh, gobbledygook to me as a young kid but it kind of uh, gave me that, that spark that I kind of followed. Because yeah. I, like, I remember getting um, like books from the library and probably um, there were, you would get magazines at the time, the yeah, yeah. computer mags, they would have like a, a tape stuck to the cover yeah, yeah. they would you know download or well, play a demo of some shoot 'em up game or something yeah. um and <laughs> often at the back i don't know if anyone else has experienced but often at the back you would find like a small um program that you could sit down you had to be really patient sit down and type it all into your commodore 64 yep. and mine like very rarely worked i'd always get syntax error oh, i was yeah, just yeah. like what the hell is syntax error yeah, you so said you, it would be you, like a 600-line yeah. thing, right? And you had to type everyone in perfectly, otherwise... Yeah. Sometimes the fun ones was when it, you didn't type in perfectly, <laughs> things exploded, but... Uh, yeah, no, that was... So you, like, you managed to kind of nut that out. You, you yeah. started to learn the logic My, of um, 
computers. And the first game I ever wrote was a horse racing simulator, <laughs> which is strange because I don't gamble and I don't like horses. So uh, there you go. <laughs> you made that yourself. Yeah, I was kind of. It was. It seemed like low hanging fruit because it's just a bunch of random number generators, really. But, yeah, right. Uh, How old were you at that time? Four. Oh, this is going back now. Probably about eight or nine. Yeah, this is going. You, did you have an older brother that was? No, I had assistant. a younger brother, and he was very impatient. He didn't like me. He wanted to just play games. He didn't want me sitting there pecking away at the keyboard. Um, I have an old, older sister, but she wasn't interested in computers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Funnily so, enough, she's a programmer now. <laughs> there you go. That's cool. Anyway, sorry. So no, you, okay. <laughs> you got right into Commodore 64. Like that's the genesis for. Yeah, that's kind of where I started. Um, got the bug for programming, but at the same time, living in a small town, there's not a lot of opportunity to follow that. So beyond my own um, self-taught stuff, there wasn't a lot. I ended up actually taking a lot of arts papers at school. So I started doing like history and geography and English and art. And then I got to when I had to go to university and I suddenly thought, how am I going to make any money out of being a history major? So I, I just did an abrupt about face and became a, a computer science major. I lasted one year and then I dropped out. And um, yeah, and then I spent a summer playing cricket, which was a really good summer. And yeah, like from there, I kind of potted around a bit, got a job doing IT support. Uh, and my, my crowning achievement there was I managed to automate my entire job so I could just push a button and all the reports would generate themselves. And people thought I was a wizard. And um, yeah, so that was pretty cool. And then my girlfriend at the time was applying to this, uh, an ad school in New Zealand, a very famous one. And while she went into the website, there was a big thing that said, Inter you know, interested in developing games? Then you like this new course. And so she sent me the, an email saying, hey, you should check this out. So I, uh, I loaded up the page and went, oh my god. <laughs> I, I didn't think you could do this in New Zealand. So I actually wrote my resignation like right then. And I sent my application and my resignation off at the same time. <laughs> and uh, just dove into game development. And uh, I was very lucky to have a, a series of really good tutors from, from through the course. Uh, one of them ended up taking a job at Midway, which had just bought a company here in Adelaide called uh, Ratbag Games. And that's how I ended up in Adelaide. So they flew me over in, I think it was November or late October in 2005. And then in December, they laid me off. They uh, shut the whole company down. So, uh, and my stuff hadn't even arrived from New Zealand then. It was still, <laughs> still on a boat. But, um, can we like just can we go into that dive yeah. into that in a little bit more detail? Sure thing. Like, so you're in um, New Zealand. You're learning how to program games, and yep. then you like then you get an opportunity. Like you, they go and want you in Adelaide to program. Was there like no talent here? Well, it was actually. No, this is a really good lesson for anyone looking to get into the games industry. It's all about who you know, not <laughs> not what you know. Um, so the the tutor that I had, a uh, um, guy called Rob Daly, really really nice guy, and uh, one of my other friends that I worked with, he's gone on to do great things at a company called Ninja Kiwi. Uh, he said to me, like Rob's a great guy. He's going to be a great contact. He's so well connected. Let's like take him out. Um, and like go go tramping with them because like you know no place to hide when it's just two of you on a, on a camp on a tramping trail and so that's what we did like um, we went away for a weekend together and hiked up this uh, uh, Lake Waikari Moana in New Zealand which uh, goes from almost sea level to one and a half kilometers up in the space of like I don't know two kilometers this way it was pretty crazy uh, yeah and so we just got to know each other really well and half of like um, you know getting a job in the industry is Proving that you're not a weirdo, <laughs> because uh, you know development or programming for starters tends to attract a certain kind of individual, and um, game development again kind of skews even stranger because it's such a well, you could earn more money in almost any other type of programming, and so you have to have a real passion for it. And often those passionate people can be some of the weirdest ones. So a lot of times it's like you know if you if you can prove that you can sit in an office with someone for eight hours a day and not cause a, a fuss, then you've already got one step up. And uh, yes, yeah, so I was very lucky. Um, when he went and worked at, at Midway, or in, ended up here in Adelaide, uh, he actually hired me as a junior programmer. And, and normally they don't relocate juniors. But because he was there singing my praises and, and saying, you know, you've got to grab this guy, uh, I was able to get in where most everyone wouldn't have yeah, right. at all. But yeah, so 
yeah. <laughs> Not what you know, who you know, but yeah. That's kind of true in many industries, though. Yeah, for sure. And also, like, and it's the other thing to take away is that it's a very small industry. And you see that in, in startups here as well, right? Like, especially around Adelaide, it's quite a tight knit community. And so uh, you, you, you can't afford to make enemies because, you know, the person that you're, that you're yelling at, telling him that he's useless today, might be the guy that you're asking for a job, you know, in two or three years. So you really got to keep your nose clean and, and, you know, don't kick up too much debt. As, as much as sometimes you'd like to, you know, just uh, keep pull your head in and learn yeah. your lesson. <laughs> That's cool. I'll, I'll try. Um, be more patient. <laughs> um, cool. So, like, so did you finish your course in New Zealand? Yeah, no, we finished our course. The, the final part of that course was a five-month project where we get to make our own, our own game. And I try and simulate, like, a real-world environment as much as possible. So we had a, like a, a publisher, which was one of the tutors acting as a publisher, and I was actually the producer on that title. Uh, so there was about 12 of us, I think, in the, in the team. So, of course, we decided to do a 16-player multiplayer vehicular <laughs> combat game, as you do. It was pretty ambitious. But um, we managed to do it. It was really cool. We won some awards, and, yeah, it was a, a good, good experience. Uh, it's from 2005. I think you can probably still grab it. It's called Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> so the, was, the idea was like a cooperative, cooperative game where you're fighting against this gigantic monolithic so you're like a degree qualified game developer. Well, the the degree, kind of. It was a postgraduate degree, but as you might remember, I never actually got a <laughs> degree. So I just kind of pretended and blagged my way through the interview to uh, get a position on the course. So. You can do that in New Zealand. Ah, oh, yeah, they didn't they didn't dig too deeply. Which is good. <laughs> <laughs> I just told them that I attended university. I didn't tell them that I never finished. But that's there you cool. Go. <laughs> so you, you ju- how old were you when you jumped on the plane? I was like here? 26 or 27, something like that. Yeah, right. But yeah, yeah. now you'll know how old I am. That's <laughs> <laughs> devious. <laughs> no, it was, um, yeah, and I literally only knew one person here when I, when I left. And uh, everyone was saying, Which what, was what are your, you going to do? Like your new boss. Yeah, and he yeah. was like, well, I didn't know, but I was walking into like a, this is PG-13 here. Walking into a big mess, right? Uh, I think I'd been there two weeks and I was working 16-hour days. Like, it was pretty crazy. And, um, and of course, the company was actually in a death spiral. I didn't know it at the time. I was just sort of nose down trying to, trying to get things done. And so um, Rob was really busy because he was putting out fires at his end. So I knew basically nobody. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was midway when you step into it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, right. How big was the team? So does, I don't know if anyone knows the background for those here in the audience, so Rat Bag Games was established two th- two thousand and <laughs> yeah, no, it's um it, it had a long history and, and it was one of the pioneers and one of the the leading developers in in Australia and, and in some cases worldwide. Yeah, they um amazing um racing simulator. Games. Yeah, that was their bread and butter. So they like uh, left turn racing they used to call it, but it was like the the dirt track where you go around around the circle. But there was a very um, niche, but very vocal and very passionate uh, group of people, yeah, community around it, and, and um, yeah, it was quite a profitable little thing. Like if you can, and this is like another lesson that we learned: if you can maintain your your, your team size and maintain your costs, you can sort of make a lot of money even within a niche, right? Um, we didn't make GTA Five, but you know, <laughs> we're making some cool little things. Yeah, um, like we had a um, dude from Ratbag. I did visual arts down at Underdale a long time ago and we had a dude, I guess he was trying to encourage anyone that was doing doing my course that was doing computer graphics kind of stuff to come along and he was talking about how they were flying someone out to, maybe this is the, where the costs started to spiral, they were yeah, flying yeah. someone out to a particular race track in Japan or somewhere and would take one step and a digital photo uh, off yeah. the ground. And the person had to walk the whole way around the track, because so, yep. they wanted the most <laughs> the accurate photo ref. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you're running, when you're driving along at 100, <laughs> you really pay attention to that dirt <laughs> whizzing underneath. But um, that's not Japanese dirt. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, they'd probably point that out. So, um, but yeah, no, like, uh, yeah. So Rat Bag Games Black like, was huge. It was big. It was certainly big. It was probably, I'm not sure, the biggest it ever got. When I was there, it was, 
it felt like it was about 80 people, but I may be wrong. Like, uh, I didn't go around and count everyone. I was too busy working. But, uh, yeah, definitely when it, when it ended, it left a big hole in the Adelaide development scene. And a company called Chrome, based up in Brisbane, um, stepped in uh, and decided to hire a bunch of guys from ex rap bad guys who couldn't leave for whatever reason Yeah. and uh, set up a studio here. So I was one of the three founding programmers of that studio. So I went from a junior programmer at Ratbag to a um, senior developer at Chrome within like nine months, I think. <laughs> so I think my salary almost tripled in that time. It was quite good. Awesome. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, Something to write home to your mum about. Yeah. Well, yeah, I actually saw my mum more in the first year I was in Adelaide than I had in the previous <laughs> year when I was in the same country. But that's, a, that's another story. The, um, but yeah, from there, like, uh, Chrome kind of grew, as a company, it grew to about 400 employees, maybe slightly more. Um, and that's the, a, like nation, nationwide. Nationwide, had, yeah. Was it in Melbourne as well? Yes, they bought a company called Melbourne House. Yeah, and ba- based in Brisbane. Yeah, two stu- had, three studios around, yeah, around the place. Adelaide and Melbourne. Yeah, and they, and they were really cool. We learned so much in such a short time there. Um, we we shipped a lot of product. Is what they did really well. They had a thing right, which is we ship on time, we ship on budget, and they they definitely nailed it. And uh, but the, the team size in Adelaide was about 50 people at max, and it got shrunk down to about 20 or 30. And I was always like behind the, the lead developer. He was one of the three that we started with. He stayed there right till the end. And I became a bit, I wouldn't say, you know, but basically my career options were to like move to another studio or to just like leave. So eventually I decided to leave. Like uh, uh, at that stage, Jindo had got back in touch with me. I worked with him at Brat Bag. Um, and he'd gone off and done a bunch of other things in the circled background and uh, touched base with me and asked me if I'd be interested in making some apps with him. And at that stage, the phone had just come out, the iPhone. It was, for me, it seemed like a huge opportunity. Like, uh, I was used to cutting discs, you know, that you send out to manufacture. And we, you can't make a mistake on the disc because that's <laughs> it. That's the one everyone gets. Um, and then I looked at the iPhone and it's like, oh, you can submit a new version. If it doesn't work, you submit another one. It's like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and then you know, the, the, the 30% cut that they take. We were used to publishers taking 95%, and that the rest of the 5% that you get had to pay off your development cost before you saw a dime. So I was like, oh my god, this is like, you know, this is amazing. So, and you know, the approval process for Apple, which is like two weeks, for like Nintendo could be two months or, or more. So you gotta be, I, I thought it was amazing. And a lot of developers who come into it now look at Apple and go, ah, oh, like, I can go on Android and just release it that afternoon. And it's like, yeah, you can, but like, you've got to see where we've come from to appreciate what that was and also what value that that provides, right? Like yeah, that, yeah. That, that filter that gets rid of you know, the bad stuff. Anyway, so uh, I uh, started like three companies around the same time <laughs> doing app development and uh, Mighty Kingdom was one, as I say, doing agency work. And at the same time, Jindo, once he made the jump into doing... Uh, app development was getting a lot of people asking him about doing apps for property and uh, even though we followed each one up and gave them a ballpark cost they all ran away but the question was asked often enough that we thought well maybe there's something here maybe we should like investigate it further and um, that's when kind of Happy Inspector was born and uh, at the same time we started a third company uh, that was focusing on tourist products for wine regions called Connect Broadcast and uh, they all had storied histories. <laughs> Some of them are still around. Actually, I think all of them are still around. But um, Happy Inspector was by far away, in the early days, the biggest runaway success. Like, uh, we got a lot of traction really quickly and, and iterated very quickly. And, um, yeah, that went on a very interesting journey. I think Stuart can uh, attest to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for those, like maybe for the YouTube audience, so Happy Inspector is a Adelaide born startup um awesome and you know lee the other co-founder is now in um the states in the valley um you know building it out to a very large company and Stuart here is an investor so um yeah are, are you allowed to go into happy inspector in a bit more detail that yeah what sort of detail would you like how, 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 nitty, <laughs> how nitty gritty uh you can just sing up if i go too far um yeah, so like, like I guess so. I remember Jindo 
Um, when we first opened the co-working space, Jindo was telling a story about how he, um, like how um, the first version of the app was just Photoshop. Yeah, there was no, there was no app. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, so they went, like they went around. Was that you and, or was it just him? Just went uh, around he, he and was, said. Yeah, it was mostly Jindo driven in. The, you know, <laughs> just like, he'd, he'd come into the, the office and ask me questions and I'd like, but I, we, we were definitely like, so Jindo's a big um, reader, and so he'd, be, he'd been reading a lot of uh, the Lean Startup and, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Like, I, I think it's like, I was just, when I heard that story, I was just like, oh, that is the yeah, coolest, yeah. most beautiful kind of story of a startup I've ever heard. Like, why do you need the whole back end when you can just show them photos of what it's going exactly. to look like? So yeah. to, to, to run through the story quickly, so we're like, uh, we decided to kind of try this thing out where you just do, you, you, you build nothing but you sell it. Uh, and um, and so Jindo initially just rang up a lot of people and said, "If I was to be developing this product, would you be interested in, in buying it?" And and almost 100% of people said yes. And so we said, "Well, would you like to have a? Uh, would you like me to come and show it to you?" And so he just mocked up a screenshot of what he thought it would look like on an iPad. Then he'd go in there and and like pretend to log in, but really just swipe to the next photo. And <laughs> but everyone was like, "Oh, that looks amazing." But then they'd say like. Oh, I wish it kind of just did this, or I wish it, it could do that. And he'd be like, oh, very cool. And then between that and the next meeting, he'd just add in those features, and then he'd do the next meeting, and they'd be like, oh, wow. Like, and so through the process, very quickly, he managed to find what resonated, what people wanted, what didn't matter, uh, and kind of almost come up with a, a flow to the, to, the, to the app. All in Photoshop. All in Photoshop, not a single line of code. So when we actually came to build it, we had a very clear idea of what the version one needed to be. And uh, yes, we were able to get there very quickly, and yeah, it was it was a very cool, and it, it was like it's interesting to read the theory, but then put it in practice and see that it works, right? And yeah, uh, um, yeah so it was a really it was a really cool moment for me because that was kind of like the first product that I'd taken from nothing to something, and I've got I've got to give Jinder heaps of credit; he did a lot of the heavy lifting, but uh, I was there holding on to his coattails. <laughs> and Andrew as well. Yeah, so we had a, a, an ex, another developer, um, Andrew McKenzie Ross. He had a, we hired him, when we hired him, he was working at a, uh, a um, supermarket. And the interesting thing about it is that he was working as a manager at the supermarket. And when I asked him, he's like a 18, 19 year old kid, I said, How did you get that job? And he's like, Well, I, went, I knew I had to get a job, I needed to get some money because I wanted to buy an iPhone. So he's like, How do I, I don't want to be stacking shelves. But he looked at the thing, right, and he realized, well, there's an opening for a manager here. Why not just apply for that? Because, like, what's, what's the worst that can happen? So we went in there and just said, yeah, I'm your guy. And I'm like, fair enough, gave him the job. And so he became a manager straight, straight out. And I was like, that's, that's how you do it, right? That's how you approach it. So he had, he had the right mind for uh, that whole startup sort of mentality. And uh, being, being self-taught, I had to break a few bad habits out of him. But, uh, but he's, been, he's been kicking goals ever since. And, when I um, decided to leave Happy Inspector, he stepped up to be yeah, the, cool. the CTO and has been, yeah. But you went through Startmate with Happy Inspector? Yeah, so, um, yeah, yes, basically. We went to, to Startmate in, I'm trying to can remember the year now, 2010? Yeah, 10 or 11. Christ, I can't remember. I think it was 11. Yeah. How come you know and I don't? That's <laughs> funny. Um, but yeah, that was, and that was like a, another like, eye opening experience. So Startmate is like an incubator. Um, they take, I think they took eight companies the year we went in. Uh, you go through a three-month intensive um, like mentoring, and then you go to the you know you go to the states, go to San Fran, and to New York, and you pitch to investors. And so, yeah, and they they really hammered in, into us at that early stage like what you need to focus on, what like we become a bit kind of product obsessed at that stage, like, uh, um, and they kind of made it clear to us that at the stage we were at, we needed to focus on customers um, and that the product would come. And that's kind of like where we started. So it was funny to get away from that. It, it kind of brought us back around again. And so, um, you know, we, we went, in addition to that, they take you through like a whole pitch process, how you approach an investor, how you, like, how you pitch your product and that, and that sort of thing. Can you say who they are? Oh, yeah, sorry. So the, the Startmate um, mentors, it's a bit of a group. I think uh, they're led by a guy called Nicky Shivak. Um, and there was a big motley crew. If you look on their website, you'll see all their names. Um, but no, they all offered some great advice. I think uh, 
Uh, Alan Jones, he's come down and, and spoken down here as well. He was one of them and that gave us a lot of value. Um, you know, and even the, they're building like a, like 500 startups, they're building like a network. So even the alumni from the previous year were, were like amazing at giving us a lot of advice. Like they'd, they'd just been through it so they knew all the things we'd be hitting and when we'd be hitting them and, and how to solve them. It was, it was really cool. And uh, um, from there they flew us to the US and we started doing, doing pitches. We, d we decided very early on to do like a one-man pitch thing, so Jindo was the guy, uh, which was really good for me. I could just sit back. <laughs> um, but there was this one instance in San Fran where Jindo was off talking to a, another investor to try and, and get them on board, and I went to like uh, this, this meeting, which was supposed to be like uh, a bunch of just elevator pitches, which is just a 30-second, hi, I'm Philip, I'm from Happy Inspector, you know, blah, 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 this is our app, and this, well, this is our product. And I, I thought I had a 30-second pitch down fine, but so we, we, all, we all turned up at this thing at this place and uh, everyone got there early and so they're like, well, rather than sit around for like half an hour, why don't we just run through your full pitch deck? And I'm like, oh my God. So <laughs> suddenly I had to stand up and, hi, my name is Jindo Lee. I look nothing like the photo, but I'm about to take you through uh, Happy Inspector. And I found out that the people in the room were incredibly wealthy individuals. I found out <laughs> afterwards. Uh, so it was a very interesting experience and they, they really did tear shreds out of me, but it was... It was actually really good. Like uh, I learned a lot out of it, and I had really good questions, and and really, hopefully, I gave them good answers. Um, so, like, that was for Happy Inspector. Like, That's have you Inspector, yeah. have you personally kind of gone out for Mighty Kingdom and some of your your games now? Like, have you used some of those skills? Well, I made a choice. So, just to finish off with Happy Inspector, it got to the point where we decided to move to the company to San Francisco. Yeah. Originally, we were going to keep some development here, but it, it just didn't pan out. So, I ended up being the only one left in Adelaide. And I felt that I couldn't really provide a lot of value to the company from such a distance. And I thought, well, if I moved to the US, I could do this. Um, but, you know, running through that whole process is going to be like a five year thing, you know, where you, you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, and then you make it. And I thought, you know, do I really feel passionately, that passionately about property inspection software to do this for five years? And I, and I just kept going back to like, what I really, really love doing is making games. So why don't, I'm going to do anything for five years. That's what I want to do. And that's when I decided to come back to, to um, Adelaide and come back to Mighty Kingdom. And uh, I made a decision at that point because a few people, when I spoke to them about it, were like, do you want some money, basically, like, uh, you know, to, to get you off the ground? And I thought, uh, like, having been through it with Happy Inspector and, and understanding... Um, what that means, what that entails. Like, uh, there are different kind, ty kinds of investment, obviously, and people get into it for different reasons. But I didn't want to have to have that pressure of an exit when I was just kind of starting out. Like, I, I still wanted to get into it to have a bit of fun, I guess. And it's harder to have fun when people are trying to, you know, keep an eye on the bottom line. Uh, and so I've been kind of avoiding investment in Mighty Kingdom at this stage, <laughs> but it's, you never say never. Uh, and I think if we get to the point where we have a good product, a good IP, and we want to scale, then like, it makes 100% sense to get investment at that stage to capitalise on that opportunity. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I guess that is kind of bringing us up to like Mighty Kingdom. Yeah. So, like, so to me, that sounds as though um, you started three companies. One of them was Happy Inspector, and Happy Inspector kind of blew up. Like You, you yeah. kind of... Did, was Mighty Kingdom just kind of ticking along in the background? Yeah, it was on... Uh, Happy Inspector took so much oxygen that it almost... Uh, Mighty Kingdom almost died, like, a, a couple of times. Like, uh, and that was a good lesson as well. You can't, you can't run three companies. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. Um, just pick one and, 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 and stick to it. Like, uh, you know, you can never... You, you just can't split your focus like that. So, um, Connect Broadcast, the other one, we ended up selling it to a local um, advertising agency... Um, to, which was good, like that, that, that got put aside. Um, Happy Inspector and Mighty Kingdom split, separated. Um, well, they were already separate companies, but Jindo and I ended up um, exiting each one. And so, yeah, my 100% focus has been on, on Mighty Kingdom since then. But the, um, I went through a bit of a period, I was just talking to Stuart about this before, I went through a period of trying to decide what Mighty Kingdom was going to be. Like, uh, and for a long period of time, even though I just talked about focus, I was trying to do too much in, in the company. Like, with only five of us there, I was like, you know, I'm doing biz dev, doing client management, programming, uh, game design, uh, just a whole bunch of different things. Um, my idea was that I don't want it to get too big because it'll take up more of my time doing client stuff, and I won't 
get time to do games, but I realized that even at the size that it was, I'm still running out of time in a day. And I've got a little two-year-old boy, and it's like, I'd like to see him sometimes. Uh, so I decided just a few months ago to try getting a project manager on board and seeing how that would change the dynamic. And it was like the best decision I ever made. It was uh, immediately like my workload just completely, he was coming up to me and pulling stuff off me and saying, don't do it, don't do it, just give it to me. And uh, I was able to get a lot of distance from the client stuff, which has helped me really focus on the game side of things. And so I recently scaled up that. So I've picked up three new staff focusing just on games and uh, picked up a guy, a product manager from a company called uh, Wuga over in Berlin. I'm very excited to see how that goes. He's been here for two weeks. So it's all very new. Um, but yeah, so like my goal for this year, as I said, was to make 10 games. And now that we're kind of seeing the light at the end of that tunnel, like uh, I wanted to prove that we could make games. And now that I know that we can make them, my next goal is to make money from games. <laughs> Might be a slightly harder thing, but yeah. That's cool. Um, what are the, can you, like for our audience, share some of the games that you've been making this year? Yeah, so... Like, is some of them racing? Are you going back to your rat bag of rules? <laughs> there actually is a racing game coming out between now and Christmas. Um, it's called uh, Tap Turn Racing. And it's a... Sorry, I just had to eye them down. The, uh, and it's a racing game. In this one, you only turn right. It's like, the Der- <laughs> it's like a Derek Zoolander of racing. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of a four-player party game. It's not quite dirt track, but it's, yeah. So we, 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 we tried to experiment not only with uh, different genres, but also different development tools, different release strategies, different monetization strategies, and we really took the year to try and just learn a lot of lessons. Like, uh, I like to point this out to people, but it's not the greatest uh, analogy, but, um, you know, Angry Birds was the 50-second game that Rovio had made. So they made 51 mistakes before they made their, their hit, right? And so if it takes me a year to make a game and I have to make 50 games before I get that one thing, I'm going to be an old man before I, <laughs> before I retire. But uh, so I really want to get that process down as quick as possible. So we were able to go from like idea to submission in about eight weeks maximum. And some of them fell towards the six-week end of the spectrum. So That's pretty yeah. cool. It was really cool. It was like it's been amazing. They're all iPhone games? Yes, they've all been mobile. Some of them are Android as well. Uh, we just released one, Masteroid, which is like Katamari in space, you know, Katamari. Uh, yeah, that's been, that's been kind of cool. Um, some of them have been for clients, some of them have been internal. There's a whole, whole gamut of things there. Ouch. <laughs> we, we live in a, yeah, we work in an interesting space. Um, that's cool. So um, what's, like, what is the future? Like you want to get to... How many? What about Fruit Ninja? What number? Do you know how many games they did? Before? I think it was definitely it was something like twenty or thirty games. They like and and it's, it is hard. I don't like pointing out Angry Birds or Fruit Ninja because those things are like way out. Like if you look at the the spectrum of 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 uh, releases, they're like outliers. They're like once in a lifetime you know events. You you can't release a game and expect to get five hundred million <laughs> downloads, right? That's just not going to happen. Um, but like uh, you know, Candy Crush is the, the game du jour, right? Everyone's talking about it. But if you think, if you look at the path that King took to get to Candy Crush, you know, three years ago they were like, who'd heard of them, right? Um, they created a web portal called King.com. They'd they'd try an idea, they'd put it on their portal, they'd put some traffic at it, see how it, how it went. The ones that did well, they'd punch it up to a slightly larger version and take it to a Facebook audience, see how that went. And if it did really well, they'll take it to they make a Saga version. So Candy Crush Saga was just the the iteration of, you know, like, that, yeah, right. that idea. So it's, a, it's, like, very similar to what startups do, right, particularly tech startups where you, you, you try an idea and you iterate it and, and then you keep showing it to your audience and you keep building on that mechanic until you get a very nice, tight, refined product. Like, whatever you think of Candy Crush, and, and in a lot of <laughs> ways it's very evil, but it is very, very good at what it does, which is pulling money out of your wallet yeah. and putting it in theirs. My understanding of game... Like um, running games as a business from the like from the looking at it like from an accounting kind of P and L point of view, like you want to find the whales, like you're after dudes, people that are 
for whatever reason, will spend thousands of dollars on a game, like like so, trying to make it as kind of addictive as possible, and like. Yeah, I mean, like there's a, whole, a lot of horrible terminology around that that kind of stuff, and a lot of it, I mean, it's 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 borrowed from um, casinos, yeah, and the way they they talk about their customers, and um, yeah, like I think Zynga got a bad rep for being very open about this, right? They they talk very openly about we're looking for. You know, they got minnows, dolphins, and whales, and then and, and they, they talk very openly about how they're, all they're trying to do is monetize their games. That's what everyone's trying to do, but they, <laughs> like, uh, they just got, for whatever reason, I mean, there's a lot of things that they, that they do, well, which is interesting, but... Like, uh, like, to me, I imagine that there would be, like, if it was me sitting in your shoes, I'd have this, some kind of, like, there would be this moral kind of dilemma that exactly, would, yeah. would keep me up at night, like, oh, my God, like... Someone There's, just spent five thousand dollars on my game. Like, how can I live with myself? Like, well, that guy probably there... was only like pirating it. Or... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. There's a thing that they call these days called predatory game design, which is where you're you're purely out to try and extract money from people. And you do all these bait and switch techniques and things like this. Like, it's you, and like some of the some companies employ psychologists whose job it is to try and uh, understand the buying patterns of people and. Like, it can get pretty ruthless. Um, that's when you stop thinking of it as a game, you start thinking of it as a money-making machine, right? Uh, and like those, those games, like, they really become a service, right? They're, they're not necessarily something that you buy, play, complete, and put it away, like your old, you know, Xbox games. They're, they're something that you play and you'll come back to, like, either daily or weekly or, or monthly. And, and it, the way you approach developing is you approach it as a service and you, and you have different tiers of customers and how they interact with the game and what value that you provide at those different levels. And it is a very different way of thinking, but it's very similar to software as a service, right? Like where you get people to subscribe or you, you give them a free product and then you upsell them to different um, add-ons. It's, it's very similar in that regard. <laughs> so, like, so you're taking all the kind of moral angst out of it? Well, yeah, you, you, you try. <laughs> You've still got to sleep at night. I mean, like, we, we haven't got to that stage yet where we've been really aggressively monetizing uh, any of our products. It's something that we're going to be looking at more in, as we head into next year. Um, yeah, it's, there's no... I mean, everyone's got to find what their comfort level is in that, in that equation. Like me, I'm still quite naive, I guess. I quite like to think that if you have a good game and, it's, and it offers good value and good content that that money will take care of itself. That's not always true. Like sometimes you do need to apply some of those, um, you know, those those tactics to try and get people to just come across the line. Like, there's, a, there's a language around it. They call it like, um, you know, your, your pinch point or your pain point. You've got to get to that that point where someone is really enjoying playing, but then the game stops and they're like, oh, like I really want to continue, but I can't. And I'll just spend a dollar and, and and get some more. So, yeah, it's tough. So, um, okay, that's cool. Um, so you're just going to go, like you're going to just keep smashing out 10 games a year to one kind of... I think we're going to slow down. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think what the first thing we're going to do is we're going to review what we've put out and look if there are any there that we can take, refine, like wrap another six week or on the end of that and see you know, if we can leap the product forward as much as we did in that first six weeks and we could, you know, maybe hit some, you know, early sort of success but yeah we'll, we'll be looking we'll be sitting down and evaluating what we've got we've got a bunch of prototypes and stuff that we that we make um that are sitting around just sort of in various states of, of of completeness and we'll be evaluating those and seeing which ones we want to take to market and and uh yeah sort of um my goal i guess for this next year is to take you know the games part of the business which at the moment is an investment i'm sort of it's sinking money into it and to make that uh, self-sustaining and make it profitable and uh, you know, eventually uh, separate the agency work from the games work so they can run as two separate entities. At the moment, it's all a bit muddied. <laughs> that's okay. My accountant takes care of it. Good accountant. Um, that's, well, that's another interesting point. Like you do, you've still been ticking along in the background. There have, has been some cool agency work, like um, reading on the web about your work with like, autism. Yeah, so I've got a bit of a soft spot for non-profits. Like, uh, we do a couple of work for uh, non-profit organisations. Um, with Autism SA, they came to us pretty early on and they uh, received some funding to build some apps around some um, research that they'd done. 
And so they found that uh, children who have ASD or autism spectrum disorder, they respond really well to seeing themselves, like uh, watching themselves doing things and uh, like the right way, I guess. Um, so for instance, like some kids will have difficulty saying hello to people. They don't know how to uh, approach that situation. And so what you do is you'd um, create a situation where they, you bring the kid in and you get them to role play the scenario. And uh, at Autism SA, they would record this interaction and then they'd sit down at, at iMovie and then they'd um, you know, put a little splash page, how to say hello to strangers, play the video. And then at the end, they'd attach like a, like a reward image, something that the kid resonates with. And burn a DVD and send it out to the families wherever they live to, to watch on their DVD player. So we were able to take that entire process and put it into a, an app that you can run on your phone. And um, yeah, just recently they launched the results of the study and they found like a, something ridiculous, like a 95% improvement in, in ch child's behaviour who, who prior to this, because it's an entire course, but prior to, to, to afterwards. And uh, yeah, it was, really, it was really cool. I got to sit on a on a panel um, announcing the results, and there were families there telling the story about how it had affected their their, their kids, and it was really amazing to. That's, that's really cool. That's like uh, that would make my day. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool to like you know you get obsessed with technology and and like you know startups and business and, and and all that whole money side of things, but then to actually see something which has real value to people, you know, and uh, to have an actual real impact was was really cool. It was really humbling, and makes you know all the rest of it. Put it in its yeah. perspective. perspective. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, and then the other, I guess the one final question, maybe before we open it up, if anyone's got some questions, um, CDW, like the you you run a co-working space kind of oh, ac activity. It's like not the I mean, space you work out of around. Well, that's run by another guy, Simon Scales. Yeah. So um, when we when we used to be in our old office, which was a burrito shop before we got in there. Um, uh, Simon Scales from Concept Design Workshop used to hire a desk from us and he used to run these big events, week, fortnightly long events around the country and eventually wanted a permanent space so he organised the space up there yeah, yeah. and um, came to us and said look if the, I've got this humongous space I can't fill it all, if we made a co-working space would you move in at the same rent, no overheads and I was like okay, <laughs> that's really good. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're up in the Maya Centre on Rundle Mall, up on level three. They run a whole bunch of really interesting courses over that side of things. And on our side, it's kind of like a co-working space that's kind of dedicated for creative types. So there's like a couple of animation studios in there. Um, a bunch of guys kind of drop in, drop out, do different things. But yeah, no, it's, it's kind of cool. And, a lot, and the idea is obviously, like every co-working space, a lot of collaboration or yeah. opportunity to... <laughs> To, you know, share knowledge exactly and skills. Um, so CDW, what does it stand for? Concept Design Workshop. And like the dude runs workshops. How to? Like I thought, like part of it is like learning. If you want to, if you dream of being in the the game, game industry, or film industry, yeah, yeah. So they do a lot of um, like they do a lot. So they do not just um, concept design, but they do. Uh, animation, 3D modeling, um, compositing, uh, storyboarding, character design, weapon design, vehicle design, a whole bunch <laughs> of different things. Uh, and they get right down to the nitty gritty of it. They're, they're, they're really good. They get sort of um, industry leaders from around the world, they'll fly them over. And they, uh, yeah, and they, they, it's amazing the stuff that comes out of there. That's cool. That was my question for Caesar in the back there, asking how to get into the game industry. Well, Does yeah, like find someone who's in there, become <laughs> their best friend, take them tramping. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that was how I did it, right? 100% success rate. Yeah. And it helps if you've studied it a little bit. Um, yeah, like, I, I think with, with most tech skills, you can learn it. As long as you have a fundamentally good approach to how you solve problems, then the technology stuff you can learn. Because uh, from company to company, they'll, have, they'll use different technology, although... In games, most of it's comping around Unity, which is like a, a 3D um, game engine. But you know, you'll walk into uh, Unreal and they use a different, whole different tool set. But as long as you, the way you approach your tech problems, is fundamentally sound, then you'll find it that you can go far. I always think like programmers nowadays have got it very easy, right? It's like your, your two, your two most important skills are 
how to write a good Google search, <laughs> and then how to interpret the results. And, th and that's, that's really it, like how to know what your problem is so that you can pull the answer out of what you find. But like, yeah, man, I don't know how I'd program without the internet because it's like <laughs> cutting, cutting off one of my hands. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's very cool. It's cool. That's what it is. Does anyone have any questions for Phil? Stuart. Hey, you were saying uh, Jinja with Half the Inspector, he went through Start and Eighth, and then I think he did 500 startups. Yeah. Now I think he's with some sort of property accelerator. Oh, oh yeah. How, how are all these different, or well, what's the benefit of each? Well, they all offer different. I mean, like Startmate was really the premier. I mean, so apologies to Innovise mm -hmm. and the others who might be around, but um, it was really the the premier one based in Australia. Um, and so for us, it was like, and they view this themselves as well. They they fully recommend that you use them as a stepping stone to other accelerators. And a, a lot of it has to do with the network. Like um, we went to 500 startups with, oh my lord, his name has suddenly escaped me, Dave. McClure. Yeah. So. Uh, um, and he's, he brings a lot to the table, right, that guy. And uh, the, the network at 500 Startups is amazing, and I think like, you get value out of any incubator um, in that. But a lot of times it just provides focus, and um, sometimes you need that because when you're left on your own, you can, you can drift or you forget what's important, and so they can just bring you back, back in line. But I think, yeah, definitely the... Like with the final one that they're in, which is the Inman Accelerator, I think, or something like that. Um, for them, that's very closely aligned to the property industry, which is their, their, their key vertical that they're in at the moment. So it makes a lot of sense to be in that space. And Inman is one of the largest um, you know, companies that in, in that space in terms of like the news and advertising stuff that they put out. So being aligned with them has a lot of other benefits. But yeah, I think like just the, the access to the mentoring network and, and the alumni network is like, a huge, huge uh, factor in those things. Like going through it, would you recommend the experience? Like, like yeah, yeah. Because there's, there's people around that kind of like, well, just go and build it. Like, why go through an accelerator? Like, well, there's like some people kind of feel that they're a bit kind of, um, you know, like because a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're if you're at the stage that you haven't built anything, I'm not sure there's many accelerators that would actually <laughs> take you anyway. Um, Startmate uh, applications have opened now, actually. So if you're thinking of getting into the, the 2014 class, then definitely, um, you know, start getting your act together. Uh, but did yeah, you, you did you guys get in on the first? No. Yeah. Um, yeah so, like, uh, Happy Inspector was in those days almost entirely funded by Jindo. Uh, he he sold a house basically to pay for it. Um, so when he applied to Startmate the first time, he was a sole founder, and People tend to shy away from, from sole founder companies. Even though we were involved, we weren't technically involved, if that makes sense. And so um, the second time we applied, we did it, we did it together, and, and they were much more happy, <laughs> much more receptive. And it, it, I, I can understand why. Like, um, again, we were speaking about this earlier. When you're the only one in the company, and like uh, startups, they're a roller coaster, right? You, you're high, you're at the top one day, and the next day you're at the bottom. And sometimes you need someone else to help you out of that trough and back up again. And when you're the only guy there, some days you don't want to get out of bed. And if you're the only one, sometimes you don't get out of bed. You just bury your head and disappear, um, which is, uh, you know, for me, has been a bit of a struggle going back to Mighty Kingdom. But uh, Jindu and I stay in contact almost daily, uh, sometimes hourly. <laughs> uh, you know, so we kind of lift each other up. He, he's really keen to see us succeed in Mighty Kingdom. We're really keen to see him succeed. We still do a lot of work with him, actually, like, when he's got stuff beyond what they can do there, they'll send some stuff our way. So we're all still very intimately connected. This is very cool. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Phil? Up the back. Well, if once you dump uh, your, your game into the app store or something like that, how does it start getting? There's so many apps. How does it not pass from the crowd? How do you feel like you're putting all this work in and you're just going to disappear? Well, the short answer is it does disappear into the crowd. You have to, uh, you have to bring a crowd with you or something? Or? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different approaches to it. Like, um, if you guys remember from a, a few years ago or a year or two ago, Draw Something, the game, you know, a lot of nodding heads around here. They, they came from nowhere, really, and, and became an overnight hit. But what they'd done in the background, again, a company that had made like 20 apps or something before that point, and each time they'd built their audience and built their audience to the point where when they launched Draw Something, they were able to advertise to their existing users and plus a 
female database that they that they built up. And with that game, because you, you you play with someone else, as soon as you've got that first group of players, that kind of grows to the next group, and then and then that incentivizes the next group and next group. Um, Candy Crush is another one. Like you you play to a point, and then to continue, you need to get tickets from your friends, and so you send invitations out to your friends and say, come to Candy Crush and, and, and give me some tickets. And so that causes that game to grow and then, then those people reach their limit and then they send again and so it grows. So there are ways to build it into your, your game mechanic, but at, the, at, at the, like the lowest level, you just buy them. You just pay for people to download your game. So a lot of platforms have like um, paper install. Like Facebook's uh, got a really good one at the moment. Um, and typical install rates are somewhere like one dollar fifty to two dollars per per user, and so uh, for a game as a service, like a freemium game, your your balancing act is to try and make sure that the the lifetime value of that consumer is going to be over the price that you paid to acquire them, so that eventually you'll you know make money, I guess, and um, that that's where like investment becomes very important because you need to keep feeding people into that funnel because that. Like you know that that lifetime value, you don't get that up front. You get that over the lifetime yeah, of that so customer. So do that component for your building, or is yeah. So there are, there are companies that will help you do that. Um, of course, whenever there's a problem, right, a company springs up to solve it. Uh, and a, another way to solve it is to go with a publisher. Like um, they'll typically take a certain amount of your revenue, and they'll also try and take your IP and everything else that they can. Um, but in return, they'll pump you through their network, and they kind of push a lot of eyeballs onto your games. So Chilingo is a really big one in that regard. Um, they published Angry Birds, so they, you can see that they've got a lot of people within that network that they can funnel at your game. Um, but there are other ones that are out there. A lot of game companies are now becoming publishers, like Halfbrick has started publishing, Rovio is getting into publishing. Um, they're all kind of viewing that as a, as a, you know, a place to be. But there's, a, there's a really good um, group of people in, in Melbourne called Surprise Attack, and, that, and they'll actually take you on that journey from like designing your game and how, how to address, you know, how to find your target audience, how to address that audience, how to like test and build and iterate your product. And now they've just got into publishing as well, so you can actually take like from, do the whole thing with them. But um, it'll cost money, right? So that's, that's the thing. Like part of the reason I hired this guy recently is to help bring a lot of that knowledge internally rather than having to constantly um, take it external. But there's, there's no sort of one magic bullet solution. It's just a lot of hard work and a lot of, as with anything, a lot of iteration, trying, failing, learning, trying again. I saw a lot of free ones. I'm like, how are they doing this? This is making no sense at all. Well, there's, there's lots of ways to monetize free. One is to put an ad in it, right? And then you just hope that you get 100 million downloads and that people look at it. Um, but more often than not, it's, you know, they'll have a mechanic in there that stops you from playing until you either wait or you pay. or um, And they, they approach that in many different ways. Like, there, there's a whole... It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's a whole rabbit hole that you can spiral down into. It's quite amazing. Sorry, I thought I saw a hand over here. Someone was scratching a nose. <laughs> um, with with um, making games for kids, I mean, is that where that moral, ethical sort of um, question... It's, a, it's actually not that bad because kids don't buy in-app purchases. Their parents do. And so if you design a free game for kids it doesn't monetize very well. Like if you look at all the app categories, um, uh, you know, in general, like I think in the game space, like 95% of them are free games, right? If you look in kids' games in particular, it's the other way around. Like 95% of them are upfront paid games. Because, um, yeah, and that's it. They might have like a, you know, you buy it, you get a story, you pay for another story kind of thing. But they're not that whole recurring um, payment scheme because they're, they're, they're not... Kids don't have, you know, credit cards, or at least none of the kids I know. Um, but yeah, so yeah, like in a lot of ways, it kind of self-balancing in that regard. You just your your value proposition there is to sell to the parent, and so a lot of that is your app store presence, your kind of like your above the fold text and stuff like that. Um, yeah, for free games, it's a different thing. You, the idea is to get people in, introduce them to your mechanic, and get them, yeah, get them coming back. So would you design a game for a niche? Yeah, so, so just mobile guys who like definitely red bike. It's it's the, it's the same that you the same reason that you do it in a regular startup because it's a lot easier to find a, a specific person, and you're going to get very good targeted feedback than if you target a very broad audience. Like um, 
you know, Candy Crush has got a very broad appeal, but it, it, it really targeted at initial stages like people who like puzzle games, you know, and I think even they'd probably skew it even, you know, more more specific than that. So you can grow outside your niche or you can get popularity beyond your your target audience. But yeah, definitely zeroing in on a particular group of people makes it a lot easier to get good feedback and iterate. Yeah. So is that part of your design process right at the beginning? Or are you just like, man, I want to do something with cars? Yeah, kind of. You, you, it's like we go through a bunch of different ways. Quite often, you, we'll start with uh, a mechanic, like an idea. Uh, we'll prototype it, and we do it just with boxes and squares and colors, like no graphics, because we don't want to sort of, in a sense, pollute your 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 um, perception of it. And then once we kind of think that there's some fun there, we'll we'll look at it and go, what kind of game would this be? Like we're we're making one at the moment. It's kind of like a endless runner where you play two endless runners at the same time. And we're trying to figure out what is it going to be, and, and we ended up kind of going down this path of dinosaurs. Um, but then we might end up, but the other path was to go down is like skier and snowboarder. So they both appeal to a very particular audience, and so it's a matter of like then taking those concepts to them and seeing which one resonates most and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you do your same iteration even on paper, even on, you know, um, and in fact, a lot of game mechanics you can iterate just like, a board game, right? You don't have to actually make a computer game to test it. We, do, we used to do this thing where we'd sit in a room, one person was the game, and I'd explain the rules and other people would play, and I'd tell you what your next move, you know, what your options are for your next move. And so you could test a game mechanic very quickly without actually having to write any code. Um, so yeah, quite often the idea will come first or the mechanic comes first, then we figure out what audience it resonates with, and then we double check that. You're always constantly going back and saying, are we making, you know, the right decision, or we, at least we're making an informed decision. So you, you know, you start with a bunch of unknowns, and eventually you just keep narrowing it down until you kind of know where you're going. Any questions for Phil that they want recorded? I guess otherwise, like <laughs> otherwise, it's all bits are off. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Phil, we may be lucky. Phil may stick around for a few more minutes. Like he's pretty, like he was smashing out um, an app tonight, like a game tonight, just before getting up. Here on stage, so he's pretty busy, but he may stick around if you want to ask him one burning question. Otherwise, if you don't have any other questions, even a smoldering you. question, <laughs> it has to be burning. <laughs> it has to be burning. Oh, okay. Otherwise, like, just say it now. Anyway, oh, cool. Here we go. How much you put forward to a project for a game? What would you say? Like, this is just no, nah, no further. You know, you can... Well, the well by limiting it to like six to eight weeks it limits how much you can spend. Part, part of the reason we limited it as well is to try and force people to make decisions and stick with them. So that is, I, I found like in console dev, there's a lot of talking and not a lot of building. It's the same as like startups, right? A lot of people talk about um, starting a company, but actually starting one is like, you know, get off your chair and, and, and do it. Um, yeah, so, and that kind of limits how much you can spend. So the, the typical team would be uh, one programmer, one artist, and one designer. And more often than not, the designer was actually the, the um, programmer or the artist. Like designer in the sense is the game designer. Um, and so by keeping it to two or three people, you keep them across very, very low. So you can kind of do the math and, and figure like, yeah, we wouldn't spend near 50 grand. It's probably closer to, to 15 to 20 grand. Um, so there you go. Yeah? Yeah, we we'll try um, using overseas programmers that drive you insane. Um, yeah, so like... We've used overseas programmers before in, at Mighty Kingdom and uh, at other, other, other businesses. They, they can work, but they take just as much effort to manage as a local developer. So you have to, it's in, as long as you accept that, um, that it's not like a set and forget. As much, you know, the, the, amount, the amount of time you spend talking with a dude sitting next to you is the amount of time you're going to spend with a team over in, over in India and, or wherever, yeah. Um, and so you just need to make sure that also, it's quality in, quality out. You have to be very clear about what it is that you want and be very upfront and tell them, at, you know, quality check it at every step and make sure that, they, that they're delivering. But, uh, you know, it's, yeah, as with anything, it's, uh, it's a process. You need to be ruthless about when to stop it as well. Like, um, Jindo used to have this really funny technique for narrowing down, um, like, if people used to work in his web company. So he'd, he had these criteria about things he wanted them to do. And so like, he'd put up a job, but he'd deliberately leave things missing in the brief. And then the people who respond, who said, 
yeah, we can do it, but you seem to have forgotten the thing. It's like, okay, you go to round two. <laughs> and then like, uh, round two was like, you know, websites could blow up at any stage. I need to know I can ring you at any time. So then he'd just ring them at random times. Like he'd set an alarm and wake up and just ring somebody <laughs> at like 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. their time and just see if they answered. And if they did, then they're round three, right? Like, so you'd just do this horrible thing of whittling these people down until you found like the really, really good few. And so, yeah, I mean, you, you need to do that. Just like hiring a, a person to work in your company, right? Like, you go through a very long process of making sure they're the right person. So you want to do the same thing for an external, you know, you can't just go no desk and type, make me a game and then give them 20 grand and hope something good comes back. You've got to, yeah, be, still be involved. Sage advice. <laughs> Excellent. Like, Phil, been awesome to um, hear your story and awesome to have you as part of Startup Grind Adelaide. Cool. Um, so thank you very much for being um, our guest here at Startup Grind. No worries. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs>